right, everyone. Welcome back to Misinformational. This is our second episode where we break down the mis, dis, and straight up information warfare on media and social media. I have to say one of the biggest developments in the last week, although there have been quite a few, is the sudden and unexpected shock of having not only my Twitter account restored, which was suspended for 18 months for oversharing a Miami Herald news article, but also getting the 360 whatever thousand people that were following me back as well. Now, I think one of them, Christina Pushaw's facelifts just popped undone when she probably found that out. And uh, it might not stay that way for very long, but we're enjoying it while it's there. And so our audience has just ballooned from 100,000 and change to over 500,000. And so I, I think it's very strange the way that social media selectively chooses whose voices to amplify. And I'm trying to use my outlet to be an aggressive anti-disinformation agent, more so than I was when I had it before, and to amplify stories and people that don't have the kind of platform that I do. I have my following and my platform now across all of my platforms is more than the average congressperson. Yeah. And that's I'm not something that I think I've earned or have a right to. So if there's something that you think I need to amplify, my username is Geo Rebecca. And you can tweet me and I will be sure to try to do my best to get stories out there that aren't being covered. So but yeah, that's, I was going to say, before we get too far, <laughs> let's clarify. So you have here right there, that is Rebecca Jones, okay? The Rebecca Jones, the one that Ron DeSantis and Christina Pushaw have been terrorizing and unleashing troll farms on Twitter. And she is back on Twitter. And I am here to... Bounce back and forth with her. I am Dr. Cindy Banier. I am one of those congressional candidates who didn't have that big of a following. I was all right on Twitter. I was verified. Me. I wasn't there me. at all. <laughs> <laughs> I was verified until my son like plays this YouTuber song joking about people who are verified. But it actually was something that was really important because you can get access to folks and you could talk to people. And for me, it was always about the media and connecting with the media. That was what Twitter was fun. It was fun to to get in the Twitter fights with people. And if something was trending, you could jump in there. But I actually got a whole bunch of my tweets that had been picked up. I would put Newsweek and Washington Post and things like that, just making simply replying or making a comment on an issue that was going on. So just as comparison of what Rebecca's talking about here, like her being a congressional candidate and not being allowed. And you were saying last week that you were the only congressional candidate in the country who was not allowed on Twitter. The only major party candidate. I major party candidate. To see if third parties or no parties, but of all the major party candidates running for Congress, I was the only person whose campaign was not even allowed to campaign have Campaign wasn't even allowed. This was such a huge way to talk about your campaign, what was going on. It was just a major platform. Right? Especially for me, deal. considering the size of my reach that I had on Twitter. And fundraising too. Honestly, I was fundraising oh, yeah. off of Twitter as well. It was a really nice little revenue stream for grassroots candidates just to be able to have access to those Twitter followers. So it was a real detriment, I think, to a grassroots candidate like Rebecca Jones to not have access. And frankly, for really silly reasons. And let me just give an outsider's perspective on this, Rebecca, because I think it will help, right? The story that she was sharing, which is, I also shared at the time, because I was very excited as somebody who is also a kindred spirit, data scientist, love and think and believe deep in my heart that if you tell people the truth, they'll believe it. And so following along, and finally the story comes out that basically says, Rebecca was right, that Ron DeSantis is wrong. There's all these, this evidence that says that there was, the, the COVID data was not really being displayed transparently. And this story came out. Rightly, Rebecca is tweeting it out. I was retweeting it. Everybody with the brain was retweeting it, right? And then all of a sudden, boom, she was gone. And it was like, it was very strange because there was, this is at the time where there were, people were getting thrown off Twitter for like the misinformation, stuff like that. And but only very rarely to but, get suspended for COVID misinformation. The only one prominent person I know who got booted for COVID misinformation was Lori Garrett. And she got back on a long time ago. Right. So you had to really be back. Yeah, this and was like the beginning of that phase is where they were like, oh, 
maybe we should stop or so yeah. it, i feel like from the very beginning the out the way that it looked is it was just a way to wash away rebecca jones and the controversy of it because and what was the official line from twitter was like that you re, you overshared that article like what Kind that of was, and there were tons that. of conspiracy theories, just in disinformation on Twitter about that, that I wasn't there to counteract because Twitter sent an official statement to Alexander Nazarian at Yahoo News. I can let all of our viewers see that. Their official position was that I was suspended for spamming the same identical text repeatedly over and over again over a period of two days. Now. I think if I had built like some kind of algorithm to just spam all of Twitter with the link, I could understand that. But I was actually physically a control V enter. And I did it in direct response to disinformation agents commenting on my post. And so I thought I was just caught up in this like spam trap. I was like, okay, maybe yeah. I posted it too many times. It was like 70 times. Let's be fair. And uh, I got calls from every single news agency asking me what had happened because they all were convinced at the very beginning that something nefarious was at play. And I was like, oh, I just think I got caught in a spam trap. It's probably going to be restored in a few days. And then I noticed that the DeSantis's co-governor and spokesmonster released a public statement cheering it on. The same week that like their case to keep people from doing that went to state court. And because DeSantis tried to enact a law that prohibits social media companies from deplatforming candidates and, right. and other people. And I was like, oh no, they had that out within two minutes of me being banned. This was intentional. And uh, despite having spoken to multiple people at Twitter, including people at the government Twitter account, having the dean of my communication school who knew a high contact within Twitter, try herself to figure out what went on. Nothing was going to happen. It was a board level suspension, which hmm. meant that somebody very high up had decided that I was going to be banned and I was not coming back. So their official reason again was spamming a news article, which I warned people. I was like, if they can ban people for sharing an actual news article, this wasn't Breitbart. This wasn't some alt-right right. human events fringe site. This was the Miami Herald then what's to stop them from banning journalists? And I was dismissed as, oh, that'll never happen. <laughs> sure enough. <laughs> Until this week. <laughs> yes. One of our stories that we're going to cover for this week is the massive banning of journalists and the disinformation that kind of spread around why they were banned. And so, yeah, it was bizarre. And I was, I think, most shocked that my campaign wasn't even allowed to tweet. There were people who offered to tweet for my campaign with their personal accounts who had their personal accounts suspended just for tweeting, oh, Rebecca Jones is going to be doing this event and blah, blah, blah. And the Twitter whistleblower from earlier this year, which seems to have been buried in the mountain of crazy, revealed that there are a lot of companies that contract with Twitter. And at some points, there were people actually employed by Twitter who were serving the best interests of international, I was going to say corporate interests, but also governments. And okay. uh, one of those was Yonder, who I'm hoping Elon Musk, if he watches this, will decide to cancel their contract with, because that is where a lot of my cybots come from, Yonder. But yeah, those people are, you can't block them. Even if you do block them, they still are able to comment on all of your posts, which seems like it should not be happening. They exploit a lot of Twitter flaws, which the whistleblower revealed are they go down from the very foundation of how Twitter operates. Like there's no development side. Most times, if you have some kind of outward facing website, well, that's production, that's your live product. But behind that is something called development. That is where you develop all of your changes before you push them out to the production side. Like when we made changes to the dashboard, I didn't go in while the dashboard was live and start tweaking things. I made them on a different platform and then publish them live. Like, um. When you post a blog post, you're not writing it in real time and people can't see you writing it. You're writing it somewhere else and then you decide to publish it. It's so not completely right, but close enough. And so, yeah, this was, I was the most high profile suspension. And even we had railed Elon for talking about how he was restoring all these accounts. And yet mine was notably still blocked. So the crazy thing about it is despite their public statement that it was for that article, which is a, let's be fair, a bullshit excuse to be It's bullshit. Yeah. hundred percent bullshit. Um, is that I was restored under the program for people who were suspended for political speech. There you go. But I'm back. And, and 
until I get banned again, <laughs> I'm terrorizing the terror bots. Yeah. And I want to just uh, one moment about that because of course, now that we are doing these podcasts and Big Mouth Media is behind you, they're coming after us and stuff like that. And it's so funny because they think they're like junior detectives and they're like, is this really Rebecca or is this Cindy? And I'm like, who cares? I'm everywhere all at once. But so you had made a statement, something about not, oh, that you're on Twitter and you're, you're part of the problem kind of thing. And they were coming after me for that. And people say that to me, even irregardless of your statement, they would say to me like, oh, why are you like complaining about Elon Musk on his platform? I'm like, first of all, this is fun. I, Twitter is super fun, even though it's, I understand it's a total cesspool. There's a part of me that really enjoys like poking these these crazy people. I don't know, being a politician, like I said, the media part picks you up. But, you know, what? tell us a little bit about like why you think that it is important for you to get back on there, why you were so excited to be reinstated. I don't know that I was excited. I actually posted a video of my reaction to finding out. And I think I yeah poured a half a bottle of Kraken into a cup. But uh, because of the stress that comes with it, I remember what it's like to have bully side accounts terrorizing you all of the time. Bully side is coordinated efforts to try to push people to the point of isolation and self-doubt that they hurt themselves. Now there have been lawsuits involving this and Twitter repeatedly for them not intervening. And some of the accounts that are listed in those lawsuits are the same ones that are assigned to me. So this is obviously a for higher bit. Now, most of the time I don't pay attention to it. If you see me be sassy with a troll, I put an offside comment and then I reported, blocked and muted them. It's more for other people to see than it is for the trolls because most of them are not real people or there's somebody that has 10 accounts and I've already told them the same thing 10 times, but it's a daunting task. Yeah. Most importantly, the first thing that I did was publish a meme or a gift that I have been holding onto and I knew I would publish the second I got back. I knew from the second I got suspended, that was going to be my first tweet when I got reinstated. And it was, <laughs> but a second one was to share the Miami Herald article that I got banned for oversharing. And I put at the top, I'm only going to share this link once. This is the story that I was banned for sharing. This is the story that Ron DeSantis tried incredibly hard to keep you from reading and you should share it yourselves so that I don't get in trouble and so that it pisses him off. And of course that obviously has taken off as my pin tweet and I was going through some of my high traffic things to think why a lot of people like, why would you go through those links? The video of the raid on my home, just on Twitter had 11 million views. Mm -hmm. It reached 68 million people. That is the kind of reach someone like DeSantis doesn't want someone like me to have. It made sense. And I'm also trying to get people to go follow me on the other platforms before Twitter crashes and burns. Sure. And uh, I'm being very careful not to trigger Elon Musk <laughs> because well, he may want to impregnate you if you're um, too nice to him. We're going to break down his disinformation stuff today. So Sorry, I can't. But, there's, I swear, out of all the crap uh, with Elon Musk and him being an emerald mine and a apartheid baby, the fact that he's got, he is like Nick Cannoning the world with so many baby mamas come on let's not it's that like it's so... they don't need that it's thursday afternoon they're just going home <laughs> they don't want to think about that that's okay, just sorry. not nice <laughs> okay that's going to be turned into a gif i guarantee you the trolls will probably take oh that. yeah i'm going to see that face again <laughs> they're getting really bored with just taking weird screenshots of my face doing like all weird things yeah so at any rate, we're back. I'm going to fight the good fight until I'm booted off for doing it again. I mainly used my Twitter pre-suspension for COVID information since it wasn't really available in the state. And so I'm reassembling my Avengers, um, none of whom are still at the state, unfortunately, now. But at the time, I had this group of renegade state employees from the Department of Health, the Agency for Healthcare Administration, the Department of Corrections, people from agencies all over the state helping give me data and do analysis and updates. So we're reassembling for a massive, this is what's happened since the state stopped reporting data altogether, which was the same weekend that I got suspended. It also coincided with Jack Dorsey's trip to Miami. Hmm. It was interesting. In the weekend, I met with DNC people in Washington, D.C. to discuss me potentially moving back to Florida and running for Congress against Matt Gates. So a lot happened that weekend. And uh, we finally get to report on everything that's happened since. It's going to be yeah. fun. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Tune into the conversation on Twitter. One thing, just while we're thinking about this, because you only 
touched on it a little bit, right? But something that became very apparent, and I know you're close with Nikki Fried, and I am as well. She was the lone Democrat in the state. And yeah. one thing that she kept talking about was how authoritarian Ron DeSantis was and how he ran the state. And one of the things about your case that had always been really salient on that is this is exactly what authoritarians do when somebody threatens their view because they shut you out and they use the powers that they can to curtail your voice. Yes. And I just wondered if you have any additional insight on that, because I think that we see Ron DeSantis going to be around in Florida for a while. He could be moving and he wants to move into the White House at some point here. So we'll never allow What should we be worried about, though, with this style that he has? Oh, boy, there's a lot. That's a lot to unpack. Okay. So there, <laughs> the, I know the there's a lot. The biggest problem might be is that the people that we joke about as being crazy and stupid, like Christina Pushaw, and the other ones around him are actually incredibly good at what they do. She is, she's been referred to as his co-governor um, because Ron DeSantis is an awkward person. His voice sounds a lot like Fozzie Bear. I'm sorry for everyone who I just ruined Fozzie Bear for. Blame my husband. It was his thing. He's not charismatic. He can't control his temper. And so he had a press problem. He could not do interviews. He looked bad. So they hired Christina Pushaw. Now, we're going to have a whole thing about this woman at some point, but the basic rundown of it is that she went to Eastern Europe. She ran a propaganda and disinformation campaign for the former president who's now imprisoned and stripped of his citizenship, who was an autocratic dictator and a war criminal. She ran his disinformation campaign. Then she moved to the United States around January of 2021. Big coincidence, I'm sure. <laughs> and um, started stalking and harassing me full time. Claimed she was not getting paid, that she was doing it for a, an article, but all she ever published was a single opinion piece in Human Events, which is a far right fringe online magazine. Uh -huh. So she never, this article never came to be. Now it got so bad with them doxing me that I had to get a restraining order against her while we were in Maryland. So I got the emergency oh. restraining order and then it was twice extended for temporary restraining orders. Oh. And she was criminally charged in Maryland with violating the restraining order. Wow. After her case was dismissed, first time offender, she was hired by DeSantis immediately. And oh. those were her two previous jobs. She even put in the cover letter that leaked out that she harassed me for months and that was part of her pitch to get hired, which is absolutely insane. So she's basically a hired gun and she knows how to spread disinformation. She has a network of very unsavory character characters, including Max Mordeau, who will pop up underneath this thread. His name is Andrew McGimsey. He lives in his father's basement in Kokomo, Indiana. He has a criminal record himself. We have started trying to find out the identities of these people and we're not afraid to share them because he's a nationalist. He is a white supremacist nationalist. And yet Jared Moskowitz has done sunshine interviews with him. So yeah, these people have, Jared Moskowitz is not a good person. He's about as a corrupt of a politician as it gets. I'm personally very glad that he's going down with this whole cyber. He took $300,000 from this. What is oh, it called? Yes. Yeah. The guy who made up a new currency and everyone's shocked that it wasn't real. <laughs> no, right. Anybody who's pushing crypto, just be cautious. For sure. But, but yes, yeah, so this is a very powerful network and they do this. I'm not the only person. If you look up Jim Stewartson, who made up the big, made the whole QAnon documentary, tying it to like Fred Brannan and Michael Flynn's brother, who's Joseph, I think. A whole bunch of those people. They look down here by me. Yeah, they do. They just took over all our Republican executive committees. Yep. And Chris, Christopher Boozy, who runs Bot Sentinel, who's been tracking like the Amber Heard disinformation campaign and the ones against Harry and Meghan. It's, they do, this is just the thing that they do. It should be a banned practice, but no, they worried about suspending me first. But yeah, that's the reason it's effective. They basically employed the same kind of tactics and infrastructure that they use in Eastern Europe to target Americans, especially Americans who threatened their narrative of things or the people that they were hired to do that on behalf of in this one case, Johnny Depp, but it doesn't work. That's the thing is in the end, it falls apart. So with this new documentary about Harry and Megan, there's been a huge flurry of the kind of side bots. If you haven't been to botsentinel.com, he tracks all of that. And it's insane to see most of it's artificial. 
And the same with Johnny Depp trashing Amber Heard. Johnny Depp paid $50 million to the Daily Mail and a whole bunch of other organizations to attack Amber Heard. And the most ironic and fabulous part about that story is that Johnny Depp fans were so convinced of his innocence because of all this artificial conversation injected into the social media dialogue that they paid the fee to have the records unsealed <laughs> which proved that Johnny Depp was everything that Amber Heard said he was. So it was like, oh God, that hurts so bad for you, doesn't it? Oh, that's awful. Yeah. That's so bad. The unfortunate thing, and I think that when I led off today on this, we believe as people who spent their careers in data, right? That the information, that the truth will get to people eventually, right? Yeah. But I think the sad part is that the truth will get to some people Right. Like, I think some of those people in the Amber Heard and Johnny Depp thing will look at it and be like, oh, yeah, of course, and maybe change their position. But the, one of the most dangerous things about these type of disinformation campaigns is that the more things are said over and over, psychologically, we just begin to yes. believe them. Exactly. Right? So you, you and can't when you're reading a story reason. or you're seeing a whole lot of posts that pr promote a certain viewpoint, you begin to think that there's credibility to it because you're seeing it so often. Yep. So if like, you click on a story and all of the comments are of the same messaging, just in slightly different ways, and they put in a few links to like the Daily Mail or yep. something like that, which is obviously the world's trash bin tabloid, you start Where to- Donald Trump got his start, but anyway. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you start to think that there's something to it. Even if you may, even myself may know better, you think, okay, what is, it, it seems complicated, so I'm out. That's kind of the frustration. Of course, yeah, and that's the point. That that kind of yeah. with me, by making it about me, by making what happened about me, that's one of the best ways that you can realign a conversation. So after everything broke back in May of 2020, I actually hid for five days. I didn't talk to the press. I didn't want to be on camera. That was like my nightmare. I was getting calls from people that I had admired my entire life, like Anderson Cooper, and I was screening them because I was terrified. And then that Wednesday, Ron DeSantis <laughs> went on camera in front of the vice president of the United States. And when someone asked the vice president about what happened to me, DeSantis just loses his shit. We'll put in a clip here of that because the audio is even still impressive. Is not an epidemiologist. She is not the, the chief architect. The event, obviously, she's got issues. Even after that, I was quiet for another two days until the Daily Mail smear piece came out. And they published the names, ages, photos of my children. They made up some salacious sex rumors and a whole bunch of other disgusting and vile, not just lies, but things to say about any person. It had nothing to do with academic pedigree or the awards that I've won or the work that I did while I was there in Florida. It was all about me. Yep. So I did the Chris Cuomo interview that Friday evening deciding to, this conversation was never supposed to be about me. It's supposed to be about what is happening at the state and kind of realign that story. I didn't decide to go back into it until weeks later, but by making it about the whistleblower, they distract from what the message is. They did the same thing to Alexander Vindman. Yep. They did it to obviously Dan Ellsberg by trying to send him to prison for treason. They make it about the person and then it's no longer about what the crime was. What and the content that, of the yeah. whistleblowing was. Exactly. And yeah. that's incredibly effective, especially if you employ journalists like Mark Caputo, who somehow manages to keep following upward. But during the whole ghost candidate scheme in South Florida, which briefly touched, he was yeah. one of the people that Brian Burgess, the head of the capitalist, said was a hired gun for Florida conservative politicians or operatives. And so that he's somebody who gets paid on top of his regular pay to plant the stories that look favorable for Ron DeSantis and Matt Gates, which if you go look at the things he published is exactly what he does. He fabricated an entire story about my whistleblower complaint earlier this year and I think April-ish, saying that it was dismissed, it was rejected, but it wasn't, that wasn't even my complaint. My complaint was finished in September. But even though the letter that I got for my actual complaint said that the state broke the law and endangered the welfare of the people of Florida, no one would cover the story because they had already covered what Mark, Rapu Mark sorry, Caputo had written like five months earlier. And they thought it was over. And I was like, no, actually it just ended. And it says the state broke the law. It's right there. And 
it's pretty much no matter what the story actually is, whoever says it first and loudest is the story that sticks. And that's yep. another really effective disinformation thing. But, yep. Excuse me. Yeah, so, I even got confused about that too, because and because I remember we were somewhere together at and the news had just broken out. We we're doing some campaign thing, and the news yeah. about that that case came out, and I was like, "Oh wow, great news!" And then yeah, there wasn't a lot of other follow up on it. And I will tell you the 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 trolls on Twitter, Twitter are going, "Oh blah blah blah, that's been dismissed," and they were using the Caputo article. Yes, they were because article. that was the, pretty much the only one who ran with that interpretation of it. Oh God, let's see. We're gonna have to just have a long sit down. We meander. We're gonna meander, folks. We're gonna meander. That's all right. All right. So, we're back. So, all right, so okay. we're coming up to the halfway mark for where we've been talking to at this point. I are you ready for the, your misinformation story of the week, or are you the misinformation story of the week? I'm not gonna make myself the misinformation story of the week. I debunked all the lies on our website at misinformational.com. And it's with two S's. I have actually decided, oh God, it was a tough call. I covered the COVID-19 vaccination inf disinformation on TikTok. So you can find it there because that was a top trending one. But I am actually going to cover the, e I know it sucks. I'm feeding into the machine. The whole doxing Elon Musk's jet thing. Oh, okay. Well, Good. Tell us about that one. Yeah. That Elon that. jet. Yeah, right. there was a kid who had a handle, and at the time he was in high school. Now he's, I think, a co in college at University of Central Florida, maybe? UCF? I think that's where he's at. Anyways, he's a kid. He was like 17 years old. He had this Twitter handle account called Elon's Jet. And he published from the FAA publicly available data set all the places that, you know, Elon's Jet had been traveling to. There were a couple of other spinoffs. I think there was uh, Zos's Jet and Gates Jet and stuff like that. But it was just a cheeky thing that had no harm to it. It was, it's all data you can get online. The FAA carefully tracks and publishes where every jet is because we have a vested interest in who's flying. You can't just, it's not like a car. You can't just jump into your plane and go catch up with Elon Musk out in the sky. Let's call Elon that a little post 9-11 like yeah. <laughs> tenacity, right? I don't know what their decision making is behind making it public, but that's what they do. And the Supreme Court has ruled that information is protected under the First Amendment. So that's just a little background as well. So a couple years ago, Elon offered this kid $5,000 to buy the account, the handle, so he'd stop doing it. The kid was, and this is the saddest part, and this has not been covered in this story. He was a huge Elon Musk fan. Like he huh. admired him. He said, Instead of giving him the handle, why didn't you give him like an internship or something like that? And then, or give him a Tesla. Like he, he liked Elon Musk. So instead of giving him a Tesla or I think $50,000 is what the Tesla cost or something like that, he didn't do it. And so Jack Kidd was like, okay, fine, whatever. That was disappointing. And so the, one of the first things that Elon Musk tweets after he takes over Twitter is that he's not even going to suspend the kid who has the Elon jet account. Sure enough, he did. And then a whole new slew of disinformation came flooding out afterwards. So now the, the way that this story is being pushed by the bots and the trolls is that Elon Musk's real-time location was being doxxed. And we'll get into what that means. Not only by Elon Musk, but by every single journalist mm. who talked about Elon Jet and it, where it's located now, which Facebook basically publicly invited him to come over and do it. So that would kind of led to the spurious suspension of journalists. But the big lie underneath that is that no one doxed Elon Musk. That's a lie. He has repeatedly said on Twitter that journalists were putting his life in danger. You can't, like I mentioned, you can't just jump in a jet and be like, oh, I see Elon Musk's plane is out in the sky. Let me jump in my jet. I'm going to go harass him for a bit. That's not how it works. And doxing is something that <laughs> I know quite a bit about on Twitter, seeing as I've been doxed thousands of times. Fox News is running with this diff information, which you can pretty much count if there's something out there that's not true, they're going to be in on it. Sure. Ironically, if you go to YouTube and you type in Rebecca Jones Fox News, one of the first three results is a story whose default screen is my home address, 
my driver's license number, my height, my weight, the last four of my social security, my date of birth, all of my personal details that you would need if you wanted to find me or steal my identity. I have terrible credit, so have fun with that. And I'm like, Fox News, you still have an article that I've reported multiple times for having my home address and my driver's license number and everything else. And you're calling, you're saying that Elon Musk was doxxed because someone reported where his jet was. This is not, that's not what doxing is. Twitter has always allowed doxing. This next guy has doxed me. I don't even, God, I don't even know how many times. I was doxed, I think 800 times the day before someone changed my voter registration last year, which caused me a very expensive headache via a lawsuit a year later. But yeah, it's, that's not what doxing is. So if it's just, it's ridiculous to say that journalists are aiding violent people by covering the story about Elon Musk suspending a kid who published publicly available data. That to me is insane. That is not what doxing is. That did not happen. Nobody put Elon Musk's life in danger, especially not journalists, by covering that story. But it eventually snowballed into this whole, like, I got responses that were like, well, let's see how you like it when you're doxed. I was like, bitch, do you know who you're talking to? <laughs> None of my information is private. It never has been. I have tried and tried to get my private information down from the internet. It doesn't work. I This week, I've gotten at least 10 items of mail to my home address from complete strangers. Luckily, they're all supportive, but still. I, there's no, that sham candidate I ran against, Peggy Schiller, she doxed my personal cell phone number repeatedly. Bitch. Sorry. I don't normally use that word, but she qualifies. So it's insane. I was like, you guys are, first of all, you're hypocrites. Twitter has been used to dox people left and right for all of right. time. Second, you claim it's doxing to publish data that's available from the FAA is false. And who also this, a lot of this is coming from accounts who have doxed me themselves. It's just, it's so ridiculous. And to act like the journalists here are the ones at fault or have somehow put him or his family in danger is a lie. That is a lie. That is not just misinformation. That is malinformation. It's meant to target individuals who are, he's basically trying to make them seem like they're threatening his family and it's false. And you yeah. should not participate in that conversation because it's false. But so that was the whole, just so we can, I'm trying to wrap my brain around it too, because I was watching the different pieces happening at the same time. I saw about the Elon Jet kid getting his account axed, right? Yeah. And so then not too short, not too late, late after, quickly after, then Elon, then Twitter had booted all these other re reputable journalists, and it was from what CNN, New York Times, Washington York Post, Times. a couple of other ones that were not even involved with the Elon Jet thing. There were some like Taylor Lorenz who were mm -hmm. covering his beat. She's still suspended, as far as I know, and had wrote negatively about Tesla and Tesla yeah. stocks. So at first, and he's pulling them in to this whole, they were doxing my real time location and putting my family in danger when they were not even having that discussion. They were covering it for like, I think somebody from Fox Business was even banned because they were covering how Tesla stock is tanking and there's a public plea with the board to put somebody else in charge. Hey, because it turns out you being CEO of three companies is complete bullshit. <laughs> Yeah, maybe if he was actually doing it. And then also <laughs> trying to nick can in every chick that you walks by. So anyway, yeah. but so, okay, so that was it. So there, that was the cover, it seems. So yes. the Elon Jet kid story was like the cover. Then he started booting out these, these journalists and reporters who it seems sometimes have other things yes. going on to it, right? So the exactly. people were reporting so they were covering that. him in a negative light. Okay. And so he looped them into this whole journalist who dogs me real time, even if they were discussing him and it was things that he didn't like. Now on Twitter, I'm going to be super careful not to criticize Elon Musk because I just got back on and I want to let people know that I'm on post before I get kicked off again. But even that, they just announced today, I saw an hour ago, that it is Twitter safety's new policy to remove tweets and ban accounts that are there to redirect people to other social media platforms. They said in a tweet, no more free advertising for our competitors. So if you have your account set up now, so it has your at Mastodon server or something like that in your name, take that down. 
because I they're going to ban that. you if you don't. I right now, I think, have my post link as my website link. I'm going to have to change that just so I don't get booted again. I'll probably do that the second we get off this. But so yeah, now what links you share, even if it's on a social media site, TikTok, Instagram, you could get kicked off as well. And that's really complicated because most people are on more than one platform. The types yeah. of, if you just took Instagram, yeah. TikTok, and Twitter, those are three different mediums. TikTok right. is exclusively videos and Instagram is photos and videos and Twitter is typically used for text. These are not the same utility. I'm across like all of them. And I really think I'm going to develop a post all app application that you can just do whatever you're going to do and then hit one button and it goes to all your social media and then consolidates all the comments into one thing so you can easily manage it. Maybe that's the future of social media. Who There's knows? other ones too, but then they get, they get, they don't get as much traction. traction. Yeah. And the thing is too, is that <laughs> people to the press puts way too much emphasis on Twitter and they do take comments that people make and use them as news articles. And I have to say, I think that's incredibly lazy and problematic. Oh, yeah. I was, you know, it's basically seen as a mini press release when yeah. it shouldn't be. Back when Rubio went all anti-vax after having been pro-vax, I was quoted in the article criticizing him because when he went out and got the shot, one of the earliest people to do it and had the photo op and everything was encouraging people to do it, I praised him for doing that and doing it publicly. I thought it was a good message for public health. And then he, once everybody changed their tune, was talking about how dangerous it was and how Fauci was wrong. I posted a comment, a tweet, which is not newsworthy, basically saying, I, I gave you credit for going out publicly and getting your shot and this message that it sent. And then you turn around and do this because scientists aren't all knowing all the time. That was in the article. That was not newsworthy. The media's dependence on Twitter as a news source is like I said, lazy and suspect. A lot of these articles about backlash that somebody's experiencing is based on the way that Twitter people respond to a story right. or a person. And as we know, many of those accounts are not real. They're not real. So they're multi-accounts managed by the same group of network of people. But I was going to say, I think this goes back to some of what we were talking about last week in terms of the disinformation and misinformation and that you have people who are journalists and reporters and they're making bare bones and a lot if of the ones good, that, unless they're mark caputo and then they get paid on top of their pay but that's what it is so it's like you don't have a lot of time you got to make a lot of content content and so you're looking for easy way out so you don't have a budget to go and research and get quotes from everybody so what's the easiest way to do that you just screenshot their twitter and there you go i think that th these are the complexities of this issue really is that you get more people and listen i i say use it to my advantage not on twitter necessarily but like they will put out if you write a press release and send it to the news they'll basically do your whole press release word for word and John Oliver just did this on how the police do this, right? Police will put out a police report on a particular incident, and then it will be read verbatim. And that's because- As, as the authoritative that. source of information, which we all realized after the George Floyd incidents should never, exactly. ever be taken as statements of fact. Exactly. Because the statement from the police in the George Floyd incident was, was a medical different. emergency, a medical incident. Oh, so and it ended, this is the most insulting part. I don't know if anyone's read the original thing. It actually en ends with, and no officers were harmed. Because that's the most important yeah. thing. But yeah, but it's, so the, yes, it's laziness. And yes, we can call out people, but let's call out the whole structure of it as well. Like that we have defunded or centralized to controlled media hawks, the, the Sinclair networks and things like that. So they're getting the same information and there's just not that, capacity in our reporting systems that there used to be. So I, I think that we have to have a broader conversation too about like how it is that we get people off the drip of Twitter in terms of information and start fortifying local media to be able to be more robust and not susceptible to the tidbits on Twitter, but also not susceptible to taking the Mark Caputo payouts. Yeah, I don't pay journalists and most of them do have degrees. I myself have a journalism degree and a master's in mass comm. I dual majored in science, which apparently is super confusing because nobody does both, but it happens. But yeah, there's a guy named Chris Vanderveen. He's from Colorado and he does this. He looks at official like police specifically statements and how things are reported compared to 
the actual events as it's in later investigated. But of course, if the governor's office says something, it's reported as truth. I would look at, of course, Governor DeSantis and anytime they say a quote about anything and be like, duh, they have an agenda. The same with state agencies or what we call institutional voices. They're not going to make comments that reflect that they've done something wrong. Right. The police are no different. And the media falls for it because, yeah, part of it is that newsrooms are squeezed. Served up on a platter to them. It's lazy. It is lazy. But it's challenging institutions, even from the cover of journalism, is a difficult and dangerous thing to do. Especially if, let's say, you work at a small paper or TV station who's funded in large part by a conglomerate of local people. Like in this area, Don Gates is basically owns all the media. That's Matt Gates's father. And that's problematic. You don't want to stir the pot. And right. a lot of these journalists, they shuffle because the only way to make more money is to leave. To get a better out. pay from leaving and going somewhere else than you will if you get a raise over a first year of doing a great job. And so there's this re revolving door already that exists. They're already getting paid nothing. They're expected to cover entire regions pretty much and independently decide what's important and what's not, which is a whole other thing of media. But yeah, right. and then you have just all this information aggregated from you in one place. And so why not just pull from it? And right. when it's direct quotes from people, that's one thing. Like I said, I don't think what I said was worthy of being included in a news article about disinformation about vaccines from Marco Rubio. Yeah. More important voices on that than mine. Right. Um, but I mean, it, it, hold on, like the Confederate statue stuff. I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, this was a person of prominence. So we're just going to quote them in this article. It's kind of all these articles about people who are leaving Twitter. It's like, okay, I don't care. I yeah. don't care. And people are leaving. Great. That's fine. Whatever. Bye. Go somewhere else. I'll see you there. It's not newsworthy, especially considering how many things are going on in our country. Sure. But uh, the whole backlash thing really bothers me. Is so and is facing backlash for comments. I was like, because you saw a hundred counts with no profile that were created in the last three months say that they this was something. It's like, not do better. The journalism should always strive to find truth and do it in a way that first isn't lazy, understands the burden and responsibility of doing so. Yeah. And maybe I'm holier than thou because I diverted from my journalism path to do science during my education. But at the same time, I still believe in those principles. And a lot of journalists still are very much principled, but a lot aren't. They are. But I also see what I see, especially in like local news, is that the reporters themselves are very young. They'll get them straight out of college. I guess that's just yeah. our media market, maybe. But what well, they're well, if it's a TV station, it's also because of the way people sure work. it's like the young beautiful girls and they're told by the way this is why they would never interview me or they'd be like oh we can't we ha if we interview you then we got to interview your opposition no matter where we were we're at an anti we're at a pro-choice rally right that i coordinated and that i had my people there and they would tell me that they're they have to interview my opponent in order for it to be fair i'm like but he didn't coordinate this event and you're here covering this event and i'm here or so yeah, false equivalency. So that's the climate change debacle that we often talk about is how there's a 99% consensus that humans cause climate change as we're experiencing it right now. But every single article that has climate change mentioned seems to find the same 10 people who are climate change deniers to comment on it. And it's just, oh, we're writing an article about how Germany is refinancing their fossil fuel industry to create this goal. And at the end, it'll be like, oh, and we interviewed this crazy guy who said it's not real. So there's that, bye. It's, no, you don't have to do that. Not all viewpoints are equal. And there, there is not, there's not always balance in a story. And then and you don't have to anymore. And also yeah. the fairness doctrine and stuff. And that's why it's like, it's, I know it's baloney. Like I know that they don't cover, they don't come to me after my opponent's town hall and asked to interview me, but this is what they're telling people too. So I think that there's also, this is like the, their younger people are being put up and they're told this is how you have to do things. And they're put into the system that I think you were saying before, that's controlled by these institutional and corporate interests. And they just kind of, if they want to advance in their career, they have to do certain things. Yeah. And uh, not a lot of people who come through journalism are trained even to be skeptical of things like government institutions. They'll go into journalism school and manage to come out of it thinking that those are authoritative voices that are worthy of trust. 
They're not. Even if you're a Democrat, you shouldn't take everything that Joe Biden says as a fact. It has to be checked. And if it's right, great. If not, say why. Add the context. It's so partisan too. Yeah. And that's really tragic yeah, is that absolutely. we, of course, have outlets that cater to our own beliefs and perspectives and are more there to validate and put, validate our predispositions and further their agenda than they are there to report anything. Yeah. And that happens, yes, on both sides, I'll say that, but certainly more on one side than the other. Yeah. Um, but I, I've seen it happen on the left, too. And it's very rare, but I'll be like, come on, guys, this is stupid. This is being stupid. Stop it. But it's it, the whole right side of media now is designed to do that and operate that way. Yeah. Ugh, media. All right. So any final words on the Twitter? What do we want to call it? The Twitter reporter dumping? Like, what's the takeaway point on that one? Twitter Twitter. It's called Twittergate. Why not? I'm surprised nobody's... I haven't seen Jet that Gate. happen. What do we call it? Jetgate. Jetgate. Docsgate. I don't know. We'll come up with something. But yeah, I just... It's a... It was very concerning that I was suspended for sharing a news article. And that was it. And that should have been an early warning sign that if you can get suspended for sharing news articles, perhaps they'll just suspend the journalists who write them and then remove those narratives altogether. And that's what yeah. we've seen happen. And not all of those accounts have been restored. Now, the other thing to remember about the Twitter downfall, if you look at the most popular accounts on Twitter, aside from... President Barack Obama, who still is the most popular person on Twitter, and the, pre the Prime Minister of India, those people yeah. are all entertainers. They're athletes, they're hmm. singers, Miley Cyrus, Cristiano Ronaldo, people like that. If they leave, people will go with them. So weirdly enough, it's up to the entertainment industry and sports stars to decide what happens with social media. And I hope they, I hope they know that. I feel like they may not know that, but we should tell them that. Maybe we that'll should be tell them. We yeah, should tell them that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I think that was great. Like really informative conversation about this, Rebecca. I really appreciate it. What are the, so what are, what do we have looking forward to coming up? I know that we have Christmas. Are we taking a break? Are we like pounding? We're going to take a break. We're going to take okay. a break. From Christmas. Christmas is on a Sunday, so we won't be filming on Christmas day. I will probably be taking a nap because my family keeps moving the time that we wake up to open presents back by an hour every year. And so now we basically don't go to sleep. So like, oh, we read the night before Christmas at nine. Okay, guys, it's 12. Let's wake up and do it. But yeah, I'm like, I'm not getting up until my kids get up. So that's when it's going to happen. But then my kids started getting up really early. So that doesn't work either. But yeah, not doing it on Christmas. I think the following Sunday is New Year's Day. Is yeah. that right? Oh, boy. We'll, we'll come back to you. Maybe we'll get one in there. We can maybe record we'll in between film New Year's Day and we'll have it back up the week after that. Yeah, I think it's probably the good plan. That's we've good. got some big news to announce yeah. in the new year with our media literacy project. So, oh, that's really exciting. But in the meantime, we do want to wish everybody who's celebrating holidays and you know, Hanukkah starting happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, Happy New, Kwanzaa, year. new year, whatever it is. Yeah, Kwanzaa, Just all of it. It's the, it's a magical time of the year, no matter what you're celebrating. So be kind to each other. And I say Merry Christmas, but that if you don't celebrate Christmas, that's fine. I'm an atheist. What? So I don't mean what, it. What, Rebecca, religion. you're not, <laughs> not participating in the war on Christmas, like a good Democrat? No, I'm not. You should see my house. I'm in another decoration war with my neighbors across the street. We went crazy on Halloween and now apparently it's happening with Christmas. Yeah, I me too. I'm like people. Christmas from top to bottom. Yeah, yeah, no. So anyway, happy, hope it, everybody has a wonderful time, good time to connect, share with family and friends, find some peace for yourself. And we're looking forward to 2023 with you. Yep. And we've got big announcements coming. So be sure to check with us in a couple of weeks. All right. So this is Dr. Cindy Banyan Cadone signing off for this episode of Misinformational with Misinformational herself, Rebecca Jones. See you Bye, next guys. time.